while presenting today. We're going to use scripture to support it and encourage you guys. Um, so we just want you to know that um, we are really thinking deeply about our faith and how God is impacting us surrounding these issues. Um, and then I just want to note, we're not trained counselors up here. We have big hearts. We have some life experience, a few more years than most of you. And we want you to feel helped, um, but some of you might need more than what we can give you. So please be humble enough to seek help if you need it. So up at the front, we have resource lists um, th throughout the top of the stage. So on your way out, you can grab that. Um, here we go. So I also want to say that we will be sharing very personal hardships with you today. The Lord has been at work in our lives, healing and being, bringing redemption, but there will be some strong emotional responses that you might see the panel members experience, such as crying um, and maybe being able to finish a sentence. So we just want to say that makes you uncomfortable, we're sorry, but these are really intense issues that we're sharing about, and, and this emotion is actually very appropriate to display today. Um, there can be a lot of shame that surrounds drug use, both for the user and for the family. This can lead to denial and covering up or making little of the root problems that should be addressed. Here's the problem with that. When nobody talks about it, it makes those that are struggling seem like they are the only one and that they are alone and they can't bring it up. So we need to show you guys the risks, the reality, the impact on family and loved ones to equip you to know why it's important to say no to drugs rather than just telling you, just say no. So that's why we're going in depth today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Aaron Chapin, uh, Amber's dad. And my wife, Amy, is the third grade teacher here. My daughter, Abigail, is the second grade teacher. I'm currently the police chief for the Village of McFarland Police Department, and I've got 24 years of law enforcement experience, ranging from being at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Police Department, where I spent 17 years and then three and a half years at the Village of Shorewood Hills. I'm also on the executive board, uh, or the board of directors for Safe Communities of Dane County, which is an organization that um, works to try to make sure that we address the major causes of injury in our society, and um, overdoses, death by overdose is one of those that's, uh, that Safe Communities is trying to address. Thank you for having me. Hi, my name is Kat Mays. I am first and foremost a child of God. Um, I'm a mother of four. I just got remarried to a wonderful man of God. And I used to be a drug addict. Yes, and I um, was radically, astonishingly saved and healed and delivered and set free. I am such a different person. It's literally a turnaround, a transformation that I cannot describe other than to say that Jesus Christ is real. He loves you. He loves me. Um, and he saw fit to give me a new heart and give me a new life. And it is my main mission to help anyone around me, everyone that I meet, whether it's with a word of encouragement or strong biblical advice, or just a hug, and just friendship. Um, praise God. Many of you see me around the school with the littles. Um, I am the first grade teacher here. I have two kids that go to school here in third and fifth grade. Um, and I am not here at all because I want to be. Um, I'm doing one of my least favorite things while talking about one of my least favorite topics right now. I don't enjoy sharing personal stories about myself with small groups of people, let alone with lights glaring in my face in front of all of you. Um, but addiction, which once was very, very distant from me, is a deeply personal topic. About a year and a half ago, my sister Angie died of an overdose after using heroin. <sighs> after using heroin laced with fentanyl at the age of 48. It wasn't her first time by any means using drugs. It came probably after about 30 years of drug use. And even saying it now, it seems impossible. You see, I grew up in an average household in every sense of the word. 
I know you look at that picture and you're like, that is not an average normal family. But I assure you that in the 80s, we were perfectly normal in that, those outfits. And my mom's glasses were spot on when it came to style. Amen. <laughs> it was normal at one time. And you can, we, we were a normal family. Little Blondie in the corner is me, very proud to be a member of that family apparently. My sister Stephanie and my sister Angie, the one who we're talking about today is in the red overalls there in the corner. Um, we were not wealthy by any means, but we always had what we needed. We had a stable life. Our parents had a strong marriage. We went to church every Sunday. My parents rarely drank alcohol, and if they did, they certainly didn't get drunk. And drugs were never present or thought of. When I look back, I can see that Angie started her lifestyle of addiction at a very young age, probably at about 13, 14, maybe 15. It started with things like diet pills and smoking cigarettes. Eventually, I can't tell you at what age, but I know it was in high school, she started using drugs. Since I and my family didn't know the signs of addiction, we often naively passed off things that should have been warnings to us. Her early adult life was filled with cycles in which she would appear to be on the right track for a while, but then she would just spiral out of control. In her early 20s, she married, had two kids, and divorced a few years later. She, she brought her brokenness and addictions with her into a now single parent home. In her early 30s, she had a back surgery and was given prescription opioids. It was an addiction that led to her heroin. It was that addiction that led to her heroin use and would eventually cause her to do unimaginable things and eventually steal my family of a daughter, a sister, and a mother. Although she died a year and a half ago, Looking back, I know that I lost my sister decades ago because I never, not for one day, knew her as a healthy, non-addicted adult. Sometimes I imagine who she would have been or could have been had drugs not been a part of her life. I imagine the parent her children would have had and the sister I could have had because drugs not only destroyed her, but they brought destruction to everyone she was close to. In a way, her addiction was ours, it was mine, because we had to deal with it, and we are still dealing every single day with the results of her addiction. I'm sitting here not because I want to, but because I know that my sister is not unique. I'm here to remind you how subtle Satan is. Each of us has weaknesses that he wants to use to destroy us and those around us. And because she is not unique, I am sure there are people in this room who use drugs, have used drugs, or have thought about using drugs. And I am here to share Angie's story, which became my story and my family's story, with the prayer that it may turn your hearts to God and away from the destructive path of addiction. So I just wanted to start out with just some definitions so then we're all on the same page. Um, so definition of drugs is a substance used as a medication or in preparation of medication. Something and often an illegal substance that causes addiction, habituation, or a marked change in consciousness. Um, and we'll talk more about this, but there's a legit purpose for most of them. Mr. Chapin's gonna speak more about that later. The danger comes when we use something outside of its intended purpose. So you heard Kristen say her sister started with diet pills. Um, there's a lot of normal medication that can be used the wrong way. Next slide. Opioid is a natural or semi-synthetic or synthetic substance that typically binds to the same cell receptors as opium, 
and produces similar narcotic effects. Um, so many different variations, morphine, um, heroin, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and then there's other synthetic ones such as fentanyl or methadone. They are used illicitly for their narcotic properties. Next slide. Amphetamine, how do you say that? Amphetamine? Ah, amphetamine, thank you for that. Uh, a stimulant of the nervous, central nervous system. They're often <clears throat> abused illicitly, used clinically to treat attention deficit disorder, narcolepsy, um, and formerly was used as a short-term appetite suppressant. Next one. Intoxication, so that's the condi condition of having physical or mental control markedly diminished by the effects of alcohol or drugs. Another word for intoxication could be high. It's an abnormal state that is essentially a poisoning. Next slide. Addiction, a compulsive, chronic, <clears throat> physiological, or psychological need for a habit-forming substance, behavior, or activity, having harmful physical psychological or social effects, and typically causing well-defined symptoms upon withdrawal or abstinence. You have a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. Um, and like we talked about at our last 21B Chapel, addiction isn't just drugs, right? You might have addiction to pornography or to social media <coughs> or to other things that you use to numb your pain, right? So this chapel, it is about drug addiction, but it's also broader than that. Um, so you guys can just ask the Lord, like, how can I learn from this? Next slide. Dopamine. Um, so that is the feel-good hormone, right? It gives you a sense of pleasure. Dopamine is part of your reward system. Dopamine was designed by God. He created it to reward you when you're doing things to survive. Something that triggers the release of a large amount of dopamine into your brain, it gives you the feeling that you're on top of the world and you want to repeat that experience. So dopamine can affect you from junk food, from sugar, from drugs, and from behaviors such as pornography, social media, etc. It's just anything that gives you that like thing in your brain of like, this is good, or this feels good. Next slide. Um, so what is dopamine's role in addiction to recreational drugs? Um, recreational drugs interfere with the way that your nerve cells in your brain send and receive messages. Okay, so it interrupts that. Drugs like marijuana and heroin mimic the nat natural neurotransmitters, and then other drugs like amphetamine and cocaine, it causes the release of large amounts of natural neurotransmitters or prevents the recycling of those neurotransmitters. Recreational drugs overstimulate your brain's reward center, so it gives you like way too much overstimulating. Over time with repeated drug exposure, a certain area of your brain becomes less sensitive, and you don't get the same feeling of pleasure from anything else but the drug. So like just going for a walk, watching a movie, like being with friends, petting your dog, it doesn't give you that um, dopamine hit like it used to. You'll often take or need larger amounts and longer amounts sorry, larger and larger amounts of drugs to produce that same effect. Addiction is a vicious cycle that develops from multiple mechanisms. Um, when drugs cause surges in dopamine, it's actually teaching your brain to remember that experience and to want more. And then a couple more guys. No, it's a lot of talking right now. All right, next slide. Um, so this is something to really keep in mind as we are going through the chapel today. This is a foundational truth of what God um, thinks about you guys and what Satan is trying to do in our lives, right? So John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Um, so we're going to watch a video next. And as you listen to this video and as you listen to our panel discussion, please think about it through this lens. We learned earlier this year that there is a kingdom of more, which is kind of earthly, kingdom of more, and that there is a spiritual realm that battles for our lives. We face challenges in this life. It's hard. What will we turn to and who will we turn to? A distinction, I'd say, between like a prohibition category and a wisdom category. And so I don't think scripture um, has like an explicit prohibition that says, um, hey, you just can't. You know, like the uh, maybe in the day when it was illegal in, in many states and, you know, we want to obey the laws of the land. But now that that's gone, 
Um, I, I don't think it falls into like an explicit biblical prohibition. And so I do think there's kind of a biblical freedom at one level that we don't want to set up a, a law or a rule that, that scripture does in itself place. And yet I do think the question in my mind comes to kind of a category of wisdom. Is it, even if it's permissible to use it, is it wise to use it? And uh, personally and pastorally, I would have some big reservations uh, and, and would argue that I, I think it's not wise. Uh, some of those would be, you know, people often make the comparison to it being like alcohol. We see that there are appropriate uses of alcohol in Scripture and all. Um, but I do think there's some important differences and distinctions. Uh, one of those would be, I, I think it's a lot harder to use weed uh, to kind of toke up for them and not uh, get uh, the equivalent of what with alcohol would be intoxicated, right? It seems like it's a very low bar to, to reach that level of intoxication with weed. Um, likewise, I think, uh, I don't know for every individual, but it does seem like kind of much of the in our culture, the use of, of weed and marijuana uh, is geared towards kind of disconnecting and disengaging from life and from people. Uh, you see in alcohol, even in scripture, when it's used appropriately in moderation and all, uh, that part of the goal is kind of community and celebration and themes of bringing people together to celebrate what God's done, to celebrate the life that he's given and all. Um, and yet in contrast to that, marijuana seems to have kind of an individualistic bent that pulls you away from people, pulls you within yourself, causes you to become more disengaged, uh, not only from people, but also kind of from life in general. One of my best friends growing up uh, began, you know, smoking weed more in high school. And over the course of about three years, I saw him just fully disconnect and unplug from relationships and activities. And we used to surf together and write music together and to go on adventures together and go outdoors. And gradually all those things started slipping away. Um, and he just wanted to sit in his room all day and smoke out. And, and I'm not saying that that's everyone, but I do think there's kind of a trajectory in that kind of going inward direction that is um, a, a warning sign kind of uh, would suggest kind of an unwise uh, use there. Um, and finally, I, you know, I do think even just practically uh, the use of marijuana being linked over time to mental health disorders and things of that nature. Um, and I think we want to be of, of sound mind long term to be able as, as much as we can to be able to care for our, our families, our communities, our churches, our friends, and, and um, not do things that could jeopardize or militate against us being able to be present to love and to serve as Christ would have us in those ways. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I also would put it in the category of wisdom. Um, I could never, um, as a pastor, say to one of the members of my congregation, yeah, feel free to enjoy marijuana recreationally just because I think um, uh, I also feel like you, you really can't have sound mind uh, when, you're, when you're high. I think a lot of people give you this false idea that, you know, there's a functional high uh, and it just kind of, you know, keys you out and you're okay. But I, I just have never, I've never experienced that personally. Uh, and so, uh, you know, before I was a Christian, I smoked marijuana to, like you said, disengage uh, from both people and and issues. Uh, and so I would actually ask people in my congregation, what is the reason for the desire to unhinge from community and unhinge from reality? And then begin to ask the more deeper and significant questions like, where does this desire come from? What are you experiencing in your life that is causing for you to want to escape? I mean, it's the same question you would ask somebody who consistently would be uh, you know, intoxicated. What is it that you are running from? What is it that you are escaping? Uh, I think the, the challenge with marijuana is it's kind of like a one hit and done. And so uh, you're immediately uh, at, in that place of intoxication. Uh, so I, I also would put it in the category of wisdom. I mean, I mean, there's some unique challenges medicinally. Some people use it for medicinal purposes. Um, and, and that I would really have to flesh that out with, with a member of my congregation. But in the category of recreational, I, would, I, would, I couldn't in good conscience tell them to, uh, to partake in, in marijuana recreationally. And to the next, or the first question for our panel today, um, I just want to say, uh, the reason that I wanted to be up here today, um, I actually had a student in my art classes that I was pretty close with. She didn't graduate from here, but I was invited to her baby shower. I was close with this student. 
um, involved in her life after she left here. And she just drank and did marijuana and thought it was no big deal. Um, but that did lead to a lifestyle of addiction. And the last time I've tried to, I keep trying, and I have old numbers, I can't get a hold of her anymore. Um, the last thing that I actually did was I just looked her up in the court systems of Dane County and I was able to find her face there as someone who's been arrested and has multiple um, offenses and has had jail time. And she looked awful, you guys, and she's using meth now. And like, so it's, it's something on my heart, like as a teacher, could I have done something to help this student out? Um, and I'm not feeling guilty about that, but it's just this practical question. Like, if we're equipped to know the warning signs for our friends and family, for our coworkers, uh, for the students we love, maybe we can intervene at an earlier stage and help. Um, but, and then, yeah, so through Every Daughter also, I work with women who do struggle with addiction, and it's a vicious cycle. Um, like, we'll keep talking about, but this video that we watched, it states oftentimes that marijuana is seen as harmless, and I've heard countless of my own friends say that. It's legal in a lot of states. What is your opinion and why? You want to? Sure. Um, so I think this actually might be a good time to address the um, legitimate uses for many of the, the things that are out there. So um, I can tell you that over the course of my career in law enforcement, which I'm on my 25th year now, there's been a shift, particularly in marijuana, that when I started my career, overwhelmingly people were against it, were seeing damages, and that, that culturally, we've seen a significant shift where it's more acceptable. There's more and more states that um, have medicinal use, and more and more states that are now allowing recreational use. So. Culturally, it's become more acceptable, but I think it's important for us to recognize as Christians, just because things go on in culture doesn't mean that that's God's will for us. So just because society says something's okay doesn't mean it's, it's good, and that's the wisdom piece. A lot of the drugs that are out there, so uh, the opioids, they're used for pain management, and a lot of people who end up finding themselves in a cycle of addiction go to a doctor for legitimate pain purpose, get prescribed that medication for pain legitimately, and then inappropriately use it, and then it turns into a cycle of addiction where they need more, and they need more, and then they need something else that takes them further. <clears throat> um, marijuana does have legitimate medicinal purposes. Cancer patients who can't eat, um, it helps calm their stomach, so they, when they're on chemo, they're vomiting constantly and things like that. There's really nasty things that chemo, which is supposed to treat the cancer, does to our bodies. So patients who are on chemo, medicinal marijuana can, can assist them with that. Um, so I think it's just that wisdom piece of us being able to stay within uh, legitimate purposes, and I've, I find it very hard to find a legitimate purpose for recreational marijuana. So that's kind of my personal take on it. And I've seen people who, uh, specifically working on the UW-Madison campus, I was there for 17 years, and there's more marijuana use on UW-Madison campus than alcohol, I think. Uh, that has shifted. I think when I started, it was more alcohol, and now it's more marijuana. But you see students who are failing classes because they're getting high and not attending class because they want to go smoke pot with their friends. So um, I just think it's uh, again, that can I and should I? And society has told us that these things are okay. Um, I would think that, again, the, the wisdom of the two pastors that shared, um, that under wisdom, I would, I would just argue that it's not. Just because you can does not mean you should. If you are not a person with such extreme um, seizures or convulsions uh, because you have a disease, if you are not on chemotherapy so that you can stay alive because you have gotten cancer, there is not a reason for you to be using marijuana. If you're just doing it to feel good, you're on a dangerous path. Your life will be taken from you without you even knowing it. And then, for a lot of people, it is too late. There are many people that are not allowed to bounce back, and I don't know why. And that's a hard question, but there are people that never get the chance to sit 
here as a changed person set free. And sometimes it starts with just smoking a joint with your friends. How has addiction affected your life? And that could be personally through a friend or family member or through strangers or coworkers that you've encountered. Um, it's interesting because there was a lot of denial going around in my family for a lot of my sister's addiction. That, well, she's better now, or she's, you know, she's on the right path now, but she was never on the right path. And when I look back at her adulthood and her teenage years, I can see how addiction was eating away at her and eating away at my family the entire time. There's this lie that I think we all believe when we're doing something we know we shouldn't do. It's not isolated to just drug use. There's this lie that Satan tells us that, well, it's just us. Like, it's not your parents that this is affecting. Who cares, right? It's not your siblings. It's not your friends. It's a lie. Like my family for years was being ripped apart by her addiction, by her impulsive, erratic behaviors, by the one crisis after another crisis after another crisis that we dealt with due to her addictions. And it's not just you. Whatever negative choice you're making, it's not just you. It's everybody around you. So addiction has affected my life um, in several different ways. I, um, um, if you could skip to the one where there's two pictures of me before. There we yep. Go. So on the left is the picture of me, um, and on the right, really, but um, that is me when I was fully addicted to crystal meth. <laughs> Praise God that I don't have to live like that anymore. My addiction didn't get that bad right at first. I... Um, I left my first husband um, due to several different reasons. There was abuse going on in the home. There was just a lot. And I took my four children. Well, one was in my belly still. I was pregnant with three kids, and I took them, and I left him, um, ending our marriage. And through a long series of events, um, I was homeless. I had no way to get a job having a newborn baby and three toddlers uh, without a home and without family around. Eventually, my children, all four, went to live with their father, and he did not do the right thing in that he allowed me to stay in contact with my children. Um, at this point, I wasn't using. I had just uh, been taking care of my children, and, you know, there's no time to do anything but care for them. Um, but my heart wasn't right. I wasn't following God at the moment. I was not teaching my children to follow God. I was just trying to survive. And when my children went to live with their dad, he hid them in a different state um, than we have ever lived in. I didn't know where they were. Eventually, I found out they were in West Virginia. He wouldn't allow me to call them or come see them, and my heart was crushed. I was in constant torment. Um, you guys don't understand this, and hopefully you never will, but for a mother that is completely devoted to her children, stay-at-home mom, doing that thing, and then the children are all of a sudden gone forever. Um, I don't know how to describe that kind of pain, but I was tormented at every moment with a physical pain, um, scary thoughts in my head, you know, are they okay? What's going on with them? Who's taking care of them? Is anybody um, bathing them right? Are they being fed? Um, so this... Constant torment led to me. I couldn't handle it anymore, and I was going to end my life. And right before I, um, I was going to shoot myself, and right before I did that, I heard a voice say, if you do this, you will never see your kids again. And so I put the gun down, 
and I just sat there and cried, and I didn't know what to do. Um, so I started drinking alcohol to stop that pain, and that led to, you know, when I went to sleep and woke up again, I was hurting again, so I drank again, and um, eventually someone offered me cocaine, and they were like, hey, this will make you feel better, and I'm like, sure, you know, and I tried it, and um, it did make me feel better until the drug wore off, and then I felt so much worse than I did before I ever even drank. So much worse. Your body crashes when you come off of a drug. Um, you go through depression. Your body shakes really bad. Uh, there's several things that happen. In your brain, um, we were talking about neurotransmitters and stimulants, drugs, that speed up your brain and cause the transmitters to bounce from side to side, telling your body what to do and how to function. Drugs, some drugs speed that up, and that you kind of get like a feel good for a moment. But when that drug leaves your body and you're coming down, is what they call it, then you feel really, really bad. So bad that you have to either do a drug again or you gotta seek help because you can't deal with it by yourself. So that basically led me to months and months of walking around drinking and doing drugs. And um, eventually I moved back to Florida and um, some old friends of mine said, you can stay with us you know, while you're getting on your feet. And I was like, okay. And Everybody in that house was on crystal meth, and I had never seen it before up until this point. And so, you know, they're like, why are you crying? What's the matter with you? I'm like, I miss my kids. I, I don't know what to do with myself. I can't handle it. And they were like, well, here, try this. You'll feel better. And so I tried it, and I felt better just for a minute. And then my body crashed again, because when the drug leaves your body, you crash and I cannot handle that feeling, so I do it again. I do the drug again and again and again and again. And that led to almost two years of being high and awake almost every day. I only slept every 13 or 14 days, and that makes you really crazy, really crazy. Uh, you cannot function and stay alive if you don't eat and sleep and take care of your body. Um, so that's just a physical side effect of it. Um, the chemical side of it was when I would do the drug and stop doing the drug, I would shake like really bad. It um, caused motor tremors is what they call it, and my hands would just constantly. So And that gets annoying quick. Um, so I did the drug again and again and again, and eventually somebody said the date uh, I heard them talk about what day it was, and I, it, was, it was 2019, and I realized I had been in this cycle for over a year now, or no, about a year, and I was like, oh my God. Something hit me right then, a realization hit me, and I was like, I haven't seen my babies in a year, and I haven't even cared. So the drugs take away your ability to care about yourself, your family, your loved ones, the very facts of life, like eating, sleeping, taking a walk, enjoying the sunshine. So I checked myself into a rehab um, for the first time, and I got angry over something stupid, probably, and left the program after about six weeks. And I went back out onto the street and started using again. And... Um, that basically, that cycle happened for about another year. Um, I would be out on the streets using drugs and drinking alcohol, and then I would realize, oh my God, it's been another six months, it's been a year and a half, I've got to figure out a way to stop this. So I would check myself back into another rehab. Um, and those are programs that let you live there, they teach you about addiction, they teach you about how to get off of drugs, and they basically, they won't allow you to be on drugs if you're there. So if you want help and you want to be there, you're not allowed to be on drugs. So you kind of start telling yourself, all right, I want to get better. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> I'm going to let these people help me. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to learn. Um, 
And for me personally, it wasn't enough at that time to help me stay off drugs forever. So this cycle continued for another six months, and I went to jail um, because I kicked a hole in the wall at a crisis center. Um, and it's crazy that I was even arrested for that because in crisis centers, they're supposed to put you in a padded room if you're kicking and screaming, or they are supposed to give you some kind of medication to calm you down and help you to sleep. Um, but that's not what happened, and they called the police on me, and I was arrested. Praise God for that. I hated it at the time. I was angry. I was like, you guys are arresting the victim. <laughs> and I was screaming. And, um, but I stayed in jail, jail for six weeks that time. I was released uh, to Teen Challenge. It is a well-known re rehab, rehabilitation center. It used to be just for teenagers. And then they started seeing how well it worked. And then they made an adult program. So I was at the adult program. And um, that was awesome for about three months. And then I got my feelings hurt, and I got angry again over something stupid, and I left the program. But this time I was on probation, and that means that if you go to jail, they let you out, but you have to do certain things. And if you don't do those certain things, they will come and take you back to jail. And so one of those certain things was me going to Teen Challenge. So when I left Teen Challenge, I broke my probation. Not only that, I went to, back to my hometown, so then I committed two, um, what do you call that? Probation violations. Probation violations. So I left the program and I left the state. I was on probation in Georgia and I went back to Florida. Um, so something happened to a buddy of mine's truck. They uh, called the police to be able to do an accident report for insurance. The policeman asked me, can I get your name so I can rule you out as a suspect? And I was like, yes, but you're gonna take me to jail <laughs> because I'm on probation and I left. And so he's like, all right, well, let me check it out. And he came back and he put me in handcuffs and took me back to jail. I was in the Tallahassee jail for six weeks and then they extradited me or took me back to Georgia where I stayed in jail for eight and a half months. And while I was there, um, for one, it was so boring. For two, it's miserable. You have to sleep on a steel bunk bed thing. And uh, it was just miserable. There were mean people there. You had to fight for your safety. Like, you just, I had no rights. I couldn't go outside when I wanted. I couldn't um, watch TV when I wanted. I couldn't eat what I wanted. I couldn't be around any of the people that I wanted to be around, thank God, because I wasn't around anybody good. Um, so what did I do? I asked for a Bible, and they gave me a Bible, and I started reading it. And um, I just felt the love of God totally bombard my heart. Now, I was in a lot of pain emotionally. I was still missing my children. I was angry with everybody in life. I hated every individual that I saw. I was so filled with anger and hatred and this mentality of being a victim. Like, and I'm, I know in some ways I was a victim of some things, and I won't go into all that, but... When you stay in that place in your mind, you don't leave any room for healing. And what my heart needed was to be healed. Um, and I needed to get saved. And I asked Jesus um, to help me. And so he did. He, he started illuminating these scriptures as I'm reading the Bible. And like, it was written just for me at that moment. And I'm like, whoa, are you talking to me? And um, I heard a little voice inside my head, the voice that told me not to kill myself, say, yes, I'm talking to you. I'm trying to reach you. I love you, and I want you. I want a relationship with you. And, and so I started allowing the Lord to heal my heart. And eventually I got back out of jail and moved to Wisconsin to go to a rehab in Janesville called Ruth's House. And... The Lord had already done so much work in my heart in jail that I was ready for rehab this time. I was ready to learn how to be a productive member of society with a job, um, going to church, and, and just being a good person. Um, and eventually, 
my uh, children and I were put back in contact with each other. Praise God, that is a miracle. And um, now that I'm married, I'm gonna be moving back to Florida to be with my children. And we will assume 50-50 timeshare, which means that my kid's dad and me will both share the time with our children equally. And that is a miracle from God. Thank you. Do you guys want to add to anything of how addiction affected your life personally or through family or coworker? Or should we? The only thing that I'd like to throw out there is that I think it's important to recognize in both of their stories, uh, and then also something that I'm going to share as well, that it's not just impacting you. Right. It's impacting everybody else in your life. And as a police chief, about a month ago, um, I <clears throat> almost lost one of my officers to a fentanyl overdose. That was nothing that he could control because he was on a traffic stop and the person that he was interacting with ended up having a straw that he had used to, to inhale fentanyl. And he had told the officer that, the officer packaged it, then was in his squad car and all of a sudden the lights started going out, he got tunnel vision. I'm not gonna go into all of it because I, um, I don't need to share all of his details, but he went unresponsive, had to be transported to the hospital, had to be Narcan three times. And it was because of somebody else's choices that he was impacted by substance use or substance abuse. So <clears throat> I just, I think it's really important to recognize that, that it's, it's not just making those choices. And that's one of the arguments that's out there for legalization of any of these substances. Well, it's your choice to do it, and they leave out the piece that it's impacting everybody else in your life, so. Um, we have to pick up our pace a little bit, but our next question is, the abuse of opioids is a national epidemic. What should we know about them? Um, so how can we be wise if we are given the choice to use them from our doctor? And then is there a difference now and 15 or 20 years ago? How did this happen? Do you want to start with that? Sure. So um, some of the things that have occurred, we talked about legitimate use of opioids. Um, probably 15, 20 years ago, doctors were writing prescriptions for hydrocodone or oxycodone for anything. If you went in and said, my left pinky hurts, you'd get a prescription for 30 hydrocodone pills without anything. And uh, people would take them. And, and like I've mentioned, it's been stated, there is a legitimate purpose. There are people who do... They are in chronic pain, they're in pain that's so significant that those drugs do give them relief and are beneficial for them. But if I've got a hangnail, I don't need oxycodone. I probably need to trim the hangnail and put a Band-Aid on it. So over the course of the past 15, 15 to 20 years, um, medical providers have actually started to, um, to rein that in. So we're seeing that medical providers are prescribing what they're supposed to prescribe as opposed to you know, just here's a month's worth of the pills, uh, and they're saying, okay, you had this type of procedure, you've got this type of illness, um, and, and prescribing appropriately. One of the other factors that kind of plays into it, and this is one of the things that Safe Communities looks at, because like I mentioned, overdose deaths by heroin or opioids is one of the leading causes of injury in Dane County. Um, and it's actually not necessarily the person who's prescribed, but it's a child, grandchild, brother, sister, some family member of the person who is prescribed and the medication is used inappropriately because they're not using their prescription. And then that person ends up getting into the cycle of addiction. So um, recognizing those types of things have been something that's happened over the past 15, 15 to 20 years to kind of rein that in and hopefully, hopefully change that trajectory. And for people like, oh, you really hurt your back because you slipped on the ice. Like, instead of going to the doctor, here, have my pill. Like, do not share medication that's not for someone else. And I think what's really important to note here, too, is fentanyl, which you hear that word a lot these days, is an opioid. And it is extremely, extremely toxic. And a very, very small amount can kill you the first time you use it. And it's very common now, if you buy a drug off the street, even like some people buy, buy Ritalin pills off the street in order to help them keep up all night to study for an exam, it is very common for them to be laced with fentanyl. And there are people that aren't even trying to use illegal drugs 
that take these pills and they never wake up in the morning. And it's very common for fentanyl, like all drugs, like my sister, like I will never know if she was taking fentanyl purposely or purposefully, but I know that she knew that there was a chance that the drug she was taking was laced with fentanyl. And if you come in contact with the littlest bit of it, it will likely kill you. So moving on to the next one, can you guys talk to us about shame? What makes it so hard to stop using? And we've talked about it a little bit, so just if you have anything else to add. So, uh, shame makes it hard to stop using because you don't even want to reach out for help. It's like uh, you listen to the lies of the enemy. Um, all the enemy can do is put stuff in your head. That's his only power over you. And you can, you can choose to let him have that power, or you can take your authority in Jesus Christ that he gave you when he died and rose again for your sins. He gave you that authority over every spirit of darkness. And so when you're, when you're on drugs, like you don't know any of that, so you just kind of listen to these voices that come in your head like they're tired of helping you. They're tired of hearing about it. Nobody cares about you. Why don't you just go ahead and die? These are things that you hear as an addict in your brain, and they're just lies from the enemy, and so they keep you from reaching out to your parents for help. They keep you to reaching, um, they keep you from reaching out to rehabs. Um, so shame is a big factor, and yeah. It's just that. What I saw in my sister time and time again is she believed that she wasn't worthy of the help. You know, I would talk to her about like, you know, Ange, what, what, are you, what are you doing with those same friends? You know that you know the path they're going to bring you down. You know the path they're going to bring you down. But somehow, she wasn't worthy of any other kind of friend. You know, what are you doing with that guy? Well, in her mind, she wasn't she wasn't worthy of the kind of guy that was actually going to take care of her. So she had to take what she could get, which usually wasn't, it never was anything that was going to help her. You know, but it, it's that cycle that it brings back into your mind over and over again. Every time something would rise up in her that I think I'm going to change, that shame would just wash over her and bring her right back to the same place where she was. Our next question is, how has God met you in your darkest time in your life? Um, and then there's a couple of questions after that, if you want to expand. Uh, the Lord met me in my lowest point when I was in jail, and I had no one and nothing left. Um, I wish I had cried out to God sooner, and I kind of did, you know, walking around. I'm like, God, you need to help me. I can't do this by myself. All I need is better people, just pick me up and throw me over there with better people and I'll be all right. Um, but it wasn't really until I truly cried out to God that I was in jail. And he did. He, he flooded my heart with his love. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. There was no, none of this getting on to me. Um, there was no, oh, well, you know better. You shouldn't have done any of that. Um, there was only love from the Father. Um, and then so, yeah, Jesus met me at my lowest point and, and healed me and delivered me. And he took away the old, angry, bitter, hardened heart. And he gave me a brand new heart um, full of love for people. And that was a complete 180 because at that point I was hating everyone. It's important to be vulnerable and trust another person because you cannot... Um, change by yourself. For one, you can't change without God. Um, you cannot change without the power of Jesus working in you. Um, but a lot of people don't experience the, the workings of Jesus all alone at first. Um, I'm not saying that you need another person to meet Jesus, but usually it's another person that tells you about Jesus and shows you maybe how to have your own relationship with Jesus. And I just want to add that you are each responsible for your relationship with Jesus. 
At some point, it's not enough that your mom prays for you. At some point, when you're growing up, it's not enough that your mom is the one reading the Bible or your dad. It is up to you. You have to learn how to pray to God by yourself. You have to learn eventually how to read your Bible alone by yourself. It's very important. Oh, bring life. Um, next question is, teens today in many ways are given so much responsibility and have intense pressure to achieve. Do you have any advice for healthy life habits? Yeah, there's, there's so many different things that we can do. And I think back to when I was in your shoes and I actually went to school here. So I sat here for chapel. Um, things have changed. You have so many more pressures, I think, than when I was growing up. Um, but making those smart choices, having good friends, one of the things that I'm seeing, um, and this, I think this speaks to addiction, not in the uh, sense of substance abuse, but we're seeing an interesting thing happen in the policing profession right now, that candidates who are coming into the career field really struggle with talking with other people, having relationship. So I would encourage you, number one, to make sure that you're having relationships, appropriate relationships with other people, with your classmates, as opposed to spending all your time on devices, doing things on social media. Um, because I see, that, I see that piece missing, and there's a correlation, again, as Ms. Gruko said, correlation to um, social media, pornography, uh, substance abuse, any of those types of addictions and those things that it's, or the thing that it's doing, it's robbing you of joy, robbing you of relationship with other people, and impacting your relationship with God. So um, the, I think the, one of the most important things that I would put out there is to have solid relationships with the people and have people that you can, you can share with. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit. I know we're kind of crunched for time. I wrote this down this morning. Um, so before anyone ever wrote a textbook for learning or teaching in schools, um, there were scriptures written and they were studying. Little boys went to school. It was mostly only little boys, you know, in Egypt and in all those places. Uh, mostly only the boys went to school and they read the Bible or they learned the Holy Torah and they learned the Bible, basically our word for the Bible. And I'm, um, so that should let you know how important it is. Before they ever even defined gravity and wrote it down in a textbook to teach children in school, they had scriptures written in a, a book, like a Bible, you know? And um, that's, that's very important. Your Bible is important. It is important that you read your Bible every single day. That is one of the most important things you could ever do. Read your Bible every single day. Thank you. Um, what if we have a friend or a family member that we're worried about? Is there hope for them? I think we've covered that. Yes, there is. Um, but how do we not risk our own health or safety? How do we help a friend? So having, having those relationships, like I said, is important. Having somebody who's a confidant. Um, and you've got an awesome group of teachers at this school. Um, so if there's a classmate that's struggling, going to one of the teachers, um, I, have the, I have the opportunity, because I'm on the elder board here, to interview uh, the new teachers that are coming in. I, I probably interview about half of them. Um, other elders take, them, uh, take other interviews. But you have teachers here and staff members at this school who their heart is for you, their heart is for God, um, and they care about your success. So utilizing the teachers as a resource, going to your parents. Um, but the worst thing to do is to not say something, to be in denial and to think that something's going to get better, because it's not. Also to break that, if you know that there is somebody who is struggling, we all have this thing in us as a good friend that you don't want to betray your friend. Um, but when you're saving a life, it's not betrayal. It's, it's help. It, it, is, it is what they need. And as good as, like, I've, 
I know that one of my biggest mistakes with my sister is that I somehow thought that I could help her, that I could get her out, and I could, like I could pray for her, like I, there are things I could do to help her, but I could not get her out of her addictions. She needed real help that she never got. And if you know somebody that is in that place, you can help them in ways, but the biggest way you can help them is by getting them the help that they need from professionals that really can help them, and you are not it. I think another thing um, in the world today, um, snitches get stitches. You don't want to tattle on people. You don't want to call the cops on people. <laughs> There was a time when I would be terrified to sit next to you. <laughs> um, but I will say today that it is OK to call law enforcement if you need um, to save someone's life. Um, don't try to save someone's life by yourself. Um, you could end up getting in trouble, too. Um, if you know somebody has drugs on them, I would at least call a hotline. I would at least um, call, it's easier to call a stranger than it is to call your aunt or uncle or your mom um, or their parents or another friend. Sometimes you can just get on your phones and call the police station and say, hey, listen, what do I do? You don't even have to tell them your name, um, but you can ask them what to do and they will be able to guide you through how to getting help for your friend or um, trying to notify someone that you have a friend that's slipping away. Um, so we're almost done with chapel. The last question for you guys is, what is one thing that you want us to take away from everything that's been covered? You may have to think. We have to think, that's okay. <laughs> um, so this is something I wrote down this morning too. Um, it's very important to read your Bible. You already heard me say that. What is um, equally as important, I think, for a lot of people, um, for everyone really, is to speak the scripture out loud. Um, it's very, very important. That is, I think, the number one reason that I am not addicted to crystal meth today is because I spoke scripture out loud over myself when I was in jail. Philippians 4.13 says... And I already know it, but I just want to be correct and read it to you. Um, it's talking about you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And that's probably the whole thing, but I just want to make sure that I'm reading it right. Oh, it's Paul saying, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, that's a verse that I said a lot when I was in jail, and I was still having cravings. Um, I don't have cravings anymore today, praise God. Um, but when I was first getting off drugs and I was miserable, I used to say that scripture a lot. I can do this because Christ gives me strength. I can do this because Christ gives me strength. And I got bold about it. And I took that scripture, and I, I owned that scripture and there's a lot of other scriptures that you can speak. You have to read your Bible to find out what they say. <laughs> um, but that's very important. I think, it, uh, I think it's important for us to recognize that the world that we live in today, as it is today, was not what God intended for us. God made a perfect world and intended to have perfect relationship with us. And because of Satan and Adam and Eve's choices, we live in a broken world. So God's intent for you is not for you to be in a cycle of addiction, is not to utilize those things. God, being a perfect God, a loving God, wants the best things for you. You know, I've got four children. I want the best thing for my kids. And being a dad, if I want those things for my kids, and I am absolutely not perfect, how much more does God want the perfect things and good things for you. So I think um, recognizing that, that we live in that broken world and that Satan looks to harm us, he's here to seek, kill, and destroy us, that's his goal. 
is to separate us from relationship with God and the way that he does that uh, is through temptation, putting these things that are enticing in front of us. Uh, and if we can make choices that are um, good choices that are in the best interest of, of our future lives, the things that I would encourage. And I think to have the, you, we all need the humility to look at somebody that has really struggled and understand that under the wrong circumstances at the wrong time and belief in the wrong lie, that it could be us. My sister, when she was however old and did her first hit of drugs, whatever it was, she was not intending to be a 48-year-old that had struggled with addiction for 30 years dying on the street. Her intent was, I'm going to do this today. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to have a normal life. But that is not what happened. And just that we all need to have that understanding that it could be us. And by the grace of God, with dependence on him, it will not be us. Amen. But living in pride and believing that it couldn't will never leave you down the road you want to go. Thank you so much for sharing, you guys. One thing that I want to share in that question is um, I think we often get in this place of feeling like our life has control over us and we're like running to keep up and we're in this hustle. Um, so my encouragement for us is how can we slow down? Like how can you take ownership of your life, your day, your week? Um, and I think a big part of that is setting aside a time to read your Bible, um, to be with friends that encourage you, um, to have a day that you don't do stuff, a Sabbath, right? Or at least a part of a day. Um, but protecting those times where you can actually be still and allow God to speak to you will change your life, um, and it will bring you true joy. Um, so that's the thing that God put on my heart for that. Um, the three people here today on this panel have huge hearts to share with you today. It is not easy to be vulnerable in front of so many people, like they've said, um, so please give them a big hand. Um, we are so blessed to have this opportunity, and we really hope that it brings life and hope to you guys today. We also know that it's a super tough topic, and for some of you, it could trigger memory, memories, um, or it could poke at really raw moments that have happened recently to you. Find someone today to process with and to pray with. Our prayer for you is that you would leave here today feeling empowered. Let me close in prayer, and then we have one more slide, and then we have um, a song to end us in, okay? So, Father, we thank you so much that you truly do bring redemption to dark places. We thank you for the stories that were shared today and for the lives, the life that was saved, that you've saved Kat and therefore um, are saving her children too. Um, and we just welcome you here today to touch the lives of the students, parents, and staff that are here. Would you help us to be a school that unites together in truth and love? Give us your eyes to see and the ability to love well when things are hard and to accept love when we need it most. Help us all to be people that bring your kingdom into every situation we find ourselves in, that we would seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, Lord. Amen.